The Old Mountain Man Kennels. American Pit Bulldogs. This was the home of Lester Hughes, a man who, in the words of Tom Garner, it is a living encyclopedia about the American Pit Bull Terrier. Mr. Hughes dwelt all his 68 years on the mountain. When we got out of the car, we noticed a very cold place, even colder than where we lived. To the left was Mr. Hughes' house, he greeted us at the door. He projected calm and self-assurance. But the intensity of competitiveness was still in him. He introduced us to his wife, Evelyn, and their two children, Christine and Cole. Then he put on a coat, and also the western-style hat. That was his trademark. We went into the yard, he had about twenty-five dogs. To our right, along the creek bank, was a row of kennels. There lay the bitches, and Lord Hughes's puppies. The kennels were well made. Next to it were a wire fence, measuring one meter and eighty centimeters. The door was in the center, and they were half a meter from the ground. In the kennel there was a small house for each dog. In the little house there was a door on the side, which allowed instant access either to a female dog with puppies, or to a sick dog. The water dispenser was automatic, and had a built-in food tray. The best feature of these kennels is that each one is lifted by a wooden. Mr. Hughes sprays water with a high-pressure hose, wipes between the boards, and he's done. At that time, the dogs that were there were Holly, who is a daughter of Jean Honey's champion Jeep Rom. Black Mert, a daughter of the outlaw grand champion of Groves. Baby Jane, a very good daughter of Crenshaw Screamer. And some pups from Eli Three's breeding, with Midnight Cowboy. In front of the kennel there was a building, which we saw as soon as we arrived. We were surprised to find that the building had heat, electricity and running water. Inside the building consists of a small office. A heated delivery room, a bathroom and a carpeted main room, which was the site of much bulldog history. The back door opened onto a covered area over the creek. It had a series of narrow bridges, they were footbridges that crossed the creek. Behind the building, the creek splits into two arms and then joins together, forming a small stone island. And on this island, on both sides of the creek, there were several bulldogs, who were barking and running to and fro. They were on overhead wires, and trying to get our attention. Each dog had a kennel, the kennels were waterproof, and also away from the cold. And some had a barrel, which was partially embedded in the ground, on the bank of the river. The dogs drank fresh water from the creek itself. They felt at home, they jumped from one side to the other, in the water of the rocks. Lord Hugh's dogs were in perfect health. Among them were the dog Long Wordo, a son of the same blood as Champion Jeep, who proved to be a great producer. Daisy, who was the daughter of Champion Jeep Rom, with the female grand champion Miss Rage. There was Bandit, which was a cross between the outlaw grand champion and the female R.C. Molly. Lil Bill Jr., who is the son of Lil Bill, with the female Sheena. Plus a variety of young dogs of great selection. Mainly Eli, crossed with Rascal, Buster, and Cowboy Bloodlines. This was the first of many times we visited Old Man Mountain. We are honored to meet a man, who is truly one of the dinosaurs in the Pitbull, and we are grateful for the opportunity to learn from him. Mr. and Mrs. Hughes have been very generous to us. He welcomed us into his home, and we developed a friendship. Mr. Hughes has been involved with the bulldog fight for 45 years. Although, he became famous in dogfighting 20 years ago. 
He became known in the 1970s as the Old Man of the Mountain. He's seen many dogs fight, and he's been a part of many of those big dogs. He is not a man who boasts of his accomplishments. Nor the type of guy who badmouths another dogman. He doesn't get involved in any gossip. Which are generally common in the world of dog fighting. He is from a time when to close a deal, it was a handshake and a word. Mr. Hughes told us. Once. A few years ago, some boys came from the Bronx, from New York. They wanted to buy an adult dog. They didn't have enough money to buy the dog they wanted. So I let them take the dog and send me the money later. Mr. Hughes shook his head and smiled. Everyone told me I would never get paid again. But the remainder of the money arrived by mail from New York. And exactly as they had promised. He has a keen eye for dogs. And also a good perception of their behavior. We heard that Mr. Lester could analyze a dog in five to ten minutes. And anyone would take one hour. We come to value his opinion of a dog far more than our own. We saw him watching what looked like a good dog in action. And when we asked about his opinion, he simply stated that in another ten minutes he would have stopped. Or after seeing a young dog not fighting well, he tells the owner, wait another month, and try again. Many dogs that came close to being discarded at 18 months of age. They became fast-track dogs. With a little more time to mature. And this was noticed, thanks to his wisdom. Mr. Hughes' philosophy is that everyone will give up. Some will quit early, and some will quit later. He also taught us a lot about why dogs give up. He saw the old champion rascal lose one fight, and then win several more fights. And he said so, about defeat. It was a withdrawal because of the heat. Rascal wasn't afraid of the other dog. In fact, when they calmed him down, he was struggling to find his opponent. And it makes sense that a dog can't get back into the fight. Because your senses are starting to fail due to heat, serious injury, exhaustion or shock. And it shouldn't be frowned upon. It is not the same dog, which stops because it is afraid of its opponent. We asked him what he thought of today's dogs compared to back then when he started dogfighting. He told us the general quality of the fast-track dogs. Today it is considerably larger than 30 or 40 years ago. And that today there are many more dogs, with incredible abilities. With a hard mouth, and gameness out there. He also told us that the way gameness is viewed has changed, particularly as it relates to cold dogs. Cold was not a term used by dogmans 40 years ago. A dog was gameness or mutt. Mr. Hughes stated that many creations were stopped by this way of thinking. I started putting dogs to fight when I was still a teenager. Started Mr. Hughes. We were sitting in the kitchen with him and his wife. And we asked how he got started with the bulldogs. He said. Back then, everyone had dogs, and there were a lot of fights going on around here. I had a large collie dog then, supposedly a thoroughbred. But I believe it was a crossbreed, with a bulldog because he had a big head, and weighed about 29 kilos. His name was Jack. We drove him all over the county. He had beaten nearly every dog in the area. One day my uncle and I were sitting with Jack, right on the bank of the river. Back then, it was more of a trail than a road. Anyway, after a while, a man appeared on the road, with a short-haired dog. He was from Tennessee. And we had heard that his dog was a fighter, and he was really mean. 
He went down the road to a country shop, and then when he was coming back, he saw us sitting there with our dog. We were looking at him, then he yelled. Boy, hold your dog. This one of mine is a very bad dog. My uncle and I looked at each other, kind of smiling, and my uncle yelled back. I think this one knows how to take care of himself. Then he repeated, hold your dog, this one will hurt him if they fight. Then I put my hand on Jack's neck, as if to hold him. The man walked past us. I waited until he was about twenty feet away. So I let go of Jack's neck and said, take it, Jack. And Jack did, but it was a mistake that Jack made. Mr. Hughes shook his head, and a rare smile crossed his face. You couldn't see the dog because of the cloud of dust. But when we got to see, Jack had his back turned. The other dog got a good grip on the knee, and Jack started to cry a little. It didn't take long, and Jack was doing nothing but crying. After the man got his dog off poor Jack. I asked him what type of dog that was. He told me, he is a pit bulldog. So that was the first pit bulldog I saw. It took six months before I got a bulldog. I don't know how good they were, but they won some backyard fights. If any of them gave up, we'd just put them back on their chain. And then we'd say he'll do better next time. Bulldogs were very rare back then. I got my first bulldogs from a man in Tennessee. That the man I met that day with Jack introduced me. We had some terrible fights, and the only conditioning the dogs did. It was to go hunting with us in the forest. At that time, we had not heard of the treadmill. Mr. Hughes told us that when he started to book serious fights with the dogs. Most matches were old country rules. In your own words. We used to let them fight until the dog stopped, or the owner got his dog. These were the rule of our time. One of the first dogs he put to fight was the old ranger dog. He is the son of Cotton Bullet. He went up against a Smithfield crowd. When I showed up with my dog, nobody really knew me. They had money. They wore rings that looked like they were worth my house, and gold tie clasps. I didn't know if they were willing to accept the amount I had to bet. Then a guy came over and supported me, his name was Whitey something. He asked me about my dog. And then he said, gentlemen, any of you who want to gamble. Come over here, and let me know your name and who you are. Some of them just looked on with disdain. As if to say, do you think you have so much money? Then he reached into his pocket, pulled out a wad of bills. They were one hundred dollars bills. So he said. If that's not enough, I have more in the other pocket. And if that's not enough, I have more in the trunk of my car. Ranger won the fight quite easily in fifty-eight minutes. And Whitey had all those men lined up to pay him when it was all over. The fight was set up by a man named Huey Hicks. Huey brought me a dog, which he wanted to fight these same people. When the dog arrived, he weighed about 41 pounds. We competed with a weight of 35 kilos, according to the rules of the old country. Before the fight ended I got to know, which dog we were putting to fight. I had already lost six months ago, to that same opponent. That dog's name was Duke. He was big and black, the son of big boy. The owner of Huey Hicks said the only way the fight could happen was old country style. Evelyn trained him for that fight. Then Mrs. Hughes spoke. He was so big he could drag me, but he was trained in obedience. And he would stay still while you put the leash on him. 
Then he would jump on the treadmill and run like crazy. He looked like a calf. He was so well trained that a woman or child could handle him. Then Mr. Hughes spoke. Except when it was time to take him to the ring. It took William Cable, Bruce King and myself to get him in the ring. Mrs. Hughes laughed. The three had to carry it, one in the middle, one in the back and one in front. And the one in front had to hold his head tight. If his head were let go, he would bite you. He was making a screaming noise in the back of his throat that was scary to hear. Mr. Hughes continued. LP conditioned and manipulated the other dog, and boy was there no way I could win. They were quite confident and their dog had already beaten this dog. They had all kinds of chances in the fight. We let them go, and Duke walked across and grabbed that dog. I don't think there was a hair on that other dog, touching the ground. Ms. Hughes added. That old dog was there more than three hours. Do you have any idea how long this is? It took so long that they wanted to let Lester go and change coaches. But the only reason Duke was fighting was because Lester was talking to him and encouraging him. If he had gone, he would have gone too. At one point, LP said. Why don't you get out of your dog's way and let him go? So I said okay, I'll get out of his way and stepped to the side. That dog came over to where I was and looked at me, then looked at the other dog that was lying down. So he went back and grabbed that dog's throat and started shaking again. Once again Duke was down, and Lester was on his knees with his face towards Duke. He was talking to him, said Mrs. Hughes. The Duke got back to his feet, Lester spoke to him. LP turned to the crowd and said. I don't know what Mr. Hughes is saying to that dog. Mr. Hughes and Duke won the fight in three hours and twenty-five minutes. The other side decided their dog was dead and gave up. The old ranger, I don't know how many he made under the rule of the old country. But he defeated everything we put against him. That son of a bitch was going to attack me if I didn't do what he wanted. I remember one time I put it on, on a twenty-foot chain behind the barn. As I approached him, I noticed he had a wild look in his eyes. I wasn't sure if he intended to be friendly or to bite me. But when I approached, he came at me. He jumped towards my face. At the last minute, I turned around. Evelyn had given me a new winter coat for Christmas. The ranger bit into the collar of the coat and tore off a large piece. He started to shake as hard as he could that piece of coat that he ripped. The second time I knocked him out and I thought I had killed him. When he came to, he was as friendly as a puppy. I believe that dog had flashbacks or something. Most of the time he would love me to death. But every now and then he would look at me like who the hell are you? Once I came with a bucket of feed. Back then, buckets were made of metal. He advanced on me again. I spun that bucket and hit him in the head so hard I thought I had killed him again. He woke up and acted as if nothing had happened. Another time I was working with him on what we called the merry-go-round. I put a chicken in a cage for him to chase. He ran so fast that he broke his training equipment. I took it right away, but he wanted to take it anyway. Man! We had a terrible fight that day. Ms. Hughes added. You could never turn your back on the ranger, at least I never did. You never really knew what was going on in his head. Remember that night the ranger got loose? And that he jumped on a dog by the river? Mr. Hughes nodded, it was pitch black and the middle of winter. 
Ranger nearly drowned the other dog. I waded into the creek and nearly died of cold to separate the dogs. Up until this point, Mr. Hughes was smiling and laughing as he reminisced about Duke and Ranger. Suddenly, he got serious again. I didn't usually see much danger in a dog that was vicious. I knew a bulldog could hurt a man, but I guess I didn't realize how bad it was. I wasn't afraid of one. But now I'm much more wary of a man-eater. They really can hurt you, even kill you. Honestly, I don't believe a grown man could kill a 30-kilo bulldog without a gun if he decided to attack you. I asked Mr. Hughes about some of the famous pit dogs he saw fight. And how he would rank them, starting with Champion Rascal. He told me. Man, he was a bulldog. He won five official fights, and several others outside of jail. He just can't be recognized as Grand Champion because he lost the first fight. I refereed that fight, it was very hot that day, Rascal got hot and didn't come back. But he didn't give up the fight, i.e. He didn't back down. I've seen a lot of dogs do this, and a lot of people yelling that he's a stray. But if the dog doesn't come back, that doesn't necessarily mean he's a stray. There have been many dogs maligned as strays who weren't. I have never seen a dog that could put Rascal back, even the one he lost to died less than half an hour after the fight. I turned a dog against him once. A really tough dog of big boy origin. I had never seen any dog make him back off. Rascal made him back off, and kept him going for over an hour until he gave up. Rascal fought any style, but he liked to work the bite to the head. He could overcome any fighting style that was put against him. I think there are so many good dogs coming through. Many of champion Rascal origin, same as any other dog, bred in the last 25 years. The dog Stompanato should be an example of this, son of the same father, and his mothers were crossed in the same way. I know that the two bloodlines seem to go very well together. Susie is a Stompanato daughter and produced some good dogs when she was crossed with Rascal Jr. Stompanato was a well-built and handsome dog. I've never actually seen him fight, and I've heard two different stories about him. One was that he had won twice in Mexico, and the other was that he was cold. I don't know if he was cold or not, but many good bulldogs today carry Stompanato blood. One story said he won, the other said he was cold. What I heard John Shavar say, he bought it from Maurice Carver, for a fifth of whiskey. He stayed with Buster for two weeks or two months or something like that and then he died. Lapasse also caught a dog, and the same thing happened to Buster, about the same period he died. I bred Buster when he was very old, but no puppies were born. He sure has produced some good dogs. His daughter Grand Champion Miss Rage killed every dog she fought except one. But the second time she fought the one that survived, she also killed him. The Midnight Cowboy was a small black dog, low and half-arched. He was a very good dog, one of the best in my opinion. I would put him in the top ten of all the dogs I've ever seen fight. He bit hard, not as hard as he'd ever seen her, but enough to win. I saw Chivo kill Billy Collins' dog in less than 30 minutes. He really was a bulldog. I would say he was also one of the best I've ever seen. Lord Hughes also named Boomerang Grand Champion as one of the best. But he thinks the fiercest dog he ever saw was Grand Champion Zebo. Champion Homer was a tough biter, but Zebo was tougher than he was. He bit so hard, to the point of killing all his opponents. 
They claim that the greaser didn't die. It is unknown if he disappeared, or if he was retired for breeding, but he was never heard from again. It wouldn't have been a tough fight if Greaser wasn't a pound and a half heavier. I saw the famous tramp dog Red Boy, he beat me once. He was good, and a solid bulldog. Some people say, that he couldn't bite hard. And that he only won because he didn't have a real competition. Huey Hicks brought me a big bitch. He wanted to put up a fight against Red Boy. So I put. The first 45 minutes of the fight, it looked like she was going to kill Red Boy. Then he started to bite her head really hard. And he bit hard. He made her stop, in 1 hour and 17 minutes. That was the only time I pitted a female against a male. And the fight was not mine. Even back then, it wasn't male versus female. And I'm not in favor of that. It's not fair to either of them. There are times when a male will not fight so much with a female. Most of the time, the female would have an advantage because of this. And the female will not always fight a male. Not how hard she would fight another bitch. This is just my opinion. Mr. Hughes, also saw the great champion Honey Bunch fighting, and told us. I think she was one of the best dogs I've ever seen. In the first fight she beat a dog that I conditioned and handled, and she killed him. I refereed her next match against a bitch named Bonnie, and she killed that bitch too. When I asked about grand champion Boda Finley, I was surprised by the answer. I asked. Have you ever seen Bo Lutter? Was he a gameness dog? He replied. No, he refused to fight back in front of 175 people. When he lost his second fight, to the dog Vindicator. I wouldn't say he was a mutt. In fact, Vindicator was probably the only dog that could defeat him. Bo was biting Vindicator's head for the first fifteen minutes or so. He had a good mouth, and he was biting hard. But then, the Vindicator started biting hard on Bo's front paws. He would bite on one paw, then go to another paw, then back to another, and Bo started to cry a little. LP bet Bob one hundred dollars that he would not fight again. LP got it right and Bo didn't fight back. He didn't cross the line, in his courtesy scratch. When he refused to fight, I told Bob. Walk around to the other corner, and see if he'll proceed. He did so, but Bo just looked at the corner of the ring. Bo won five or six more fights after giving up this time. I didn't see Grand Champion Snake fight, but James Crenshaw told me he was one hell of a dog. Champion Jeep was a good gameness dog, but I've seen better than him. I don't want to take credit from him, it's just that he wasn't the greatest dog of all time, as some people say he was. He was real gameness, any dog that fights for 3 hours and 45 minutes can be sure he is real. I know that some people said that he couldn't be beaten in the fight, that he was ahead from the beginning. But one thing is for sure he had already proved in the fight against the dog Wiener, that he could come out from under to win. I didn't see this fight, but I heard that the Weenie confused the Jeep for a good part of the fight. The Weenie was a funny dog. He was one dog tall, and two dogs long. I've seen some dogs like that that could really bite hard. They had that trait going for them. We asked Mr. Hughes, who was the dog that had the strongest bite? Other than Grand Champion Zebo. And which was the hardest biting bitch he saw? The fiercest dog I've seen in the last ten years was Champion Homer. As far as I know, no dog has spent half an hour with Homer and survived. 
He also killed several dogs in roles, before an official fight. The bitch I've seen with the strongest bite is Grand Champion Spooky. She is the daughter of the dog Homer and the female Susie. I raised Spooky and raised her before I sold her to Ricky Jones. At that time I got rid of many dogs. I think I misjudged. When I did a test fight with Spooky, they all looked bad. Spooky was so good, she made all dogs look bad. The only dog I've seen go head to head with her. It was a bitch that Bobby Hall and Jeanette bet against her. She fought Spooky for over an hour. Spooky took a terrible bite out of her head. But she was biting her chest most of the time. Spooky stopped the dog. She refused to fight, at 1 hour and 42 minutes. I heard people saying that she didn't want to go back to the fight, but she could have. The first time I saw Zebo, he bit me. Said Mr. Hughes. William Cable and I went to Lonzo's house to see his dogs. Lonzo had his dogs tied up in a narrow path. If you took a step to the side, the dogs could catch up with you. I started walking along the path, I was behind Lonzo. I stopped and asked. Can any of these dogs reach us? He said. No. And he said the dogs wouldn't bite me at all. So we kept walking. We took a few steps, when suddenly a black dog stretched the chain and bit my arm. I swung my fist, and punched him in the jaw, and he fell to the ground. That was the first time I laid eyes on Zebo. Willie Brown was there with his wife and daughter. He and Lonzo were testing a lot of dogs. They rolled a bitch from Willie into Lena. Lena was Zebo's sister. Soon after they rolled, Vindicator vs. Zebo. It was a very short test. The way they were hurting each other, it was impossible to stay any longer. Without them killing each other. The Vindicator was punishing Zebo's front paws. Zebo was hurting Vindicator's nose. Zebo was poking holes in Vindicator's snout the size of my little finger. Blood flowed everywhere. Lonzo preferred the Vindicator, but I asked Willie which dog he liked best. And he said that he had seen the two fight before, and that he liked Zebo better. I really liked Zebo, but I didn't buy Zebo that day. I came back after a few months, and Lonzo had rolled Zebo into an 80 pound dog. Zebo's shoulder was badly hurt. Ms. Hughes added. His leg was hanging off, it looked like it had been ripped off. I bought Zebo and took him home. William Cable took him to the vet. Zebo had his shoulder reconstructed. The surgery cost $75, which was a lot of money at the time. Lonzo let me take Zebo right away. I paid in installments for it. He says to this day that I still owe him the Zebo. But I paid him every Zebo penny. I went back later to Lonzo and bought four female puppies. They were the daughter of the dog Mike and the female Angie. And I paid in installments too. But I didn't pay $20 for each puppy because Willie Brown told me I wasn't going to see the dog's papers. That Lonzo wouldn't pay for the pedigree, and that was the story that I owe Lonzo Pratt $80. Of the five dogs I bought from Lonzo, three were very good, and hats off to that. Every time you buy five dogs from a man, you are more likely to get five strays than three good dogs. Of these females one won two fights, and the other died in a fight in the kennel. Of the two that didn't work out, one got cold and the other fought fifteen minutes and gave up. After Zebo was all healed up, I bet with Zebo. 
His first fight was easy. The fight was against a friend of mine, with whom I had combined with 18 kilos. The dog he brought was about 16 kilos, Zebo weighed about 18 kilos. Zebo killed him in 17 minutes. Bob Finley had a two-fight winner named Pete. We bet on 19 kilos. Pete had won his fights with a heavier weight, Zebo reached 18 and a half kilos, which was already too heavy for him. Zebo was a good dog, strong and persistent, Zebo killed Pete in 26 minutes. The next one was against my friend from the service again, and it was a really good fight. Zebo won in about 30 minutes and the dog also died. That dog, it was real gameness, he would have come back to the fight if he could have. I can't believe that man messed with bulldogs anymore after that. He was a really nice man. And I'm not going to say he's a deputy sheriff or anything like that. But he is on top of the law. Junior Bush called and said he had a fight for Zebo in Alabama. Against a guy named Esslinger, who was really mad at us at the time. We let go, and when that guy saw what was going on. I saw that he sort of felt like he'd been knocked over. He walked up to me and said. That dog can kill a dog, can't it? And I answered. Yes, he recently killed too. And if you don't get his, he'll kill you too. And Zebo won the fight in 23 minutes. Dave and Roger Adams saw Zebo the day he fought in Alabama. Dave looked at him and pointed to his back and asked me. Why doesn't he have any scars there? I answered. What I do know is that no dog has hit your ass. He called me after the fight, wanting to buy Zebo. And I told him I didn't want to sell the dog. So he made me an offer. And I set an amount, which I thought he wouldn't pay on the dog. And thus ended the matter. The next morning I was having breakfast, when I looked out the window, I saw Dave Adams pulling up in the backyard. And he had come for Zebo. He wanted to get Zebo off the chain by himself, right after I saw him stepping away from his chain. Zebo nearly bit him and kicked him out. I put Zebo inside their car. They didn't bring a carrying case, when they left Zebo had already jumped into the front seat and was looking out the window. I was wondering if they would make it to Ohio with the perfect face. Mr. Hughes shook his head, chuckling, and continued. They bet against the greaser dog. Which I believe I won four times. And there was a good story behind it, each side trying to define the other side. I was supposed to watch this fight, but my car broke down and I drove home. At three in the morning the phone rang and it was Dave Adams. Because of the time I thought Zebo had given up. He said. You won't believe what old Zebo did. And before he could say anything else, I told him. Well, I like it, send it to me if you don't want it. Then he told me that Zebo moved up to the heaviest category and won the fight. He won the fight with just under two hours. Afterwards, Zebo bit the son of Lord Dave Adams and injured the boy. I saw the boy's face, and really Zebo bit hard. So Dave Adams sold Zebo to a guy named Johnson. Zebo won two more matches after that. One against one of his nephews, Kush's son, he won that fight in 18 minutes. Zebo was the strongest dog I've ever seen. He was an excellent chest biter. No one managed to get Zebo out of the ring. And if he entered the ring against him, surely the dog would be so weak, due to the damage Zebo had done, that he would not do anything more against him. 
Zebo was swinging his opponent's front paws so much that the dog seemed not to touch the ground. He would adapt to any style of fighter. If the dog was the mouth-biting style, he sure as hell wouldn't be around very long. Zebo would bite so hard that the opponent would choose to try another fighting style. When I got Zebo, his teeth were flat, but they were so long and thick, it looked like my little finger, and that's no exaggeration. He would kill a dog without a drop of blood. I don't remember seeing much blood in any of his fights. I don't believe there would be much competition in Zebo's fight with Greaser if Greaser didn't have such a weight advantage over Zebo. They say he survived and was retired to production, and maybe he was. But I never heard from him again, or any of his offspring. Zebo would bite you or he would bite a stranger. It wasn't always, but there were times when he wasn't friendly. If when you got close to him, his eyes were wide and round. The only way you wouldn't get bitten was to get away from him. When he bit me, he didn't bite and let go. He would bite you like he was fighting, he would grab and shake. A young man from South Carolina was here once looking at some of his friend's dogs. I think he weighed about 120 kilos, he was very big and muscular. We started looking at the bulldogs, he went right on Zebo. At the time Zebo was on the chain, close to the apple tree. I gave a shout. Don't touch that dog, he will bite you. Oh he answered me. I live by training dogs, and not. There is a dog that I cannot pet. So I said. Well, that one you can't pet. He looked at Zebo and said. This puppy is cute, look how his tail is wagging. I said. He's just anticipating how much he'll enjoy biting you. Me and the other guys, we continued up the hill towards the other dogs. We haven't walked ten feet before we hear a man scream. The man was holding his arm up, and Zebo was hanging onto his arm, and rattling. I had to get a wood to get Zebo out. I believe there was no way for that man to escape Zebo. Even though he was big, surely Zebo would take him down. We all laughed and Mrs. Hughes spoke. Zebo was our house dog before we had kids. He was driving with us. I would put him in the back seat, but he would always go in the front. He would jump on my lap in front, and put his head on the window. He kept clicking his jaws, the same way they do when they're excited or nervous. Sometimes he would scare me by doing this, with his head close to my face, doing this and shaking. I threw him in the back seat, but he jumped forward again. One day we were in the car, I was throwing Zebo backwards and he was jumping forward. Lester got so mad at both of us that he slammed on the brakes, turned around, and drove home. He told us both to get out of the car, and he went alone. You couldn't reach out your hand to touch me before Zebo caught your finger. Mr. Hughes continues. I was walking with him in the parking lot before the fight in Alabama. Junior Bush came over to shake William Cable's hand. When their hands met, Zebo took their hand, didn't press too hard, took it and released it. Mr. Hughes asked his wife. Remember what fight was that? The one I brought Zebo home and put him in the barn room. And he tore everything up and ate the phone. Ms. Hughes replied. I don't remember, but I remember when you brought him from a fight, with his head and eyes swollen, his head like a melon and his eyes were almost closed. We had a black kitten, he was somewhere in the house. Lester carried Zebo inside. We thought Zebo couldn't see anything, but as soon as Lester sat him down, 
Zebo got up. Zebo was chasing the cat, and I was chasing him, trying to catch him before he caught the cat. Mr. Hughes added. Another time, we were coming back from a fight with Zebo. Everyone was asleep except the driver. We didn't think Zebo would do anything because he was injured, so we thought he would rest. When we woke up, Zebo had chewed the leash and eaten part of it. He also chewed on my belt while I was sleeping and ate a part of it. William Cable was finding it funny, until he started looking for his sweater coat to wear. He had an expensive sweater, the ones with leather patches on the elbows. Zebo ate all the leather and the collar too. William stopped laughing instantly when he found the sweater. Once I hadn't bet too much on one of Zebo's fights. I gave all my money to Evelyn to gamble. I knew nobody was going to bet against me, and you know how people are. If they see a dumb woman trying to bet, they'll take the bet. Mrs. Hughes continued. I would never bet on a fight, and I didn't know how to bet. Everyone was placing bets, and I just stood there. Zebo won in less than half an hour, and I hadn't bet anything. We asked Mr. Hughes what Zebo produced while he was his. And in his opinion, what would be the reason that Zebo was known for not producing well? He replied, I didn't breed the Zebo with no bitches out while he was here. But I came across two or three bitches from here. I bred him to a Bruce King bitch, and we had some good dogs. One was poisoned, one hanged himself, and two accidentally drowned. I believe they would have been winners. I crossed him with lonesome, exemplary dogs were born that I could never find. They were all Zebo's size. Gator was one of them, and he was the most like Zebo. I put him to fight with his brother, Blue, who was also a good dog. Gator ended up with Blue, he literally ripped off part of his snout, teeth, bones and all. Blue didn't recover and had to put him down. I stopped with Gator, because he broke free and grabbed a chained dog by the river. I had a broken leg at the time and I couldn't get there fast enough. Gator broke his teeth in that accident. I believe there was another good one in the litter, I named it Little Zebo. It was a very good puppy that I sold to someone near Lenore, North Carolina. But I lost touch with this one. I got five Zebo males that I thought would be really good dogs. But they never reached their feet. Unfortunately they were a good percentage of cold dogs, who couldn't take a bite. Jack Swinson who owned Zebo Jr. He appears in the photo in Richard Stratton's book, he was a very tough dog, but as far as I know he didn't produce. I have pictures of him fighting a boomerang lineage dog. In the photo you can see Zebo Jr. biting his shoulder. You can see that the opponent's blood is running down his leg. But Jack Swinson told me he gave up the fight. They bred many dogs of the Zebo lineage in Ohio. And from the number of bitches he bred, he didn't breed well. I know I've had more dogs from the Zebo shed let me down than any other bloodline. One of the biggest problems I had with the Zebo bloodline was weak teeth. Every three dogs I put in a fight test, at least one lost its tooth. Bill Stepp had some dogs from the Zebo shed. Willie and Ruby were really good. Larry Combs told me that if he revealed all of Zebo's lineage wins, he would be at the top of the ROM list. I asked Mr. Hughes. Do you think there is still a dog, from the Zebo line? that is of the same caliber as the living Zebo? And he replied, I've never seen McGee's panther fight. But from the commentary on the skill they saw in him, 
I believe he is the closest to the grand champion Zebo that exists today. Then the conversation turned to champion Homer Ram. I asked him. How did you acquire Homer? Mr. Hughes replied. Homer began his life in Wayne Honeycutt's backyard. Wayne repeated a cross that Tony Marks had made. Little Rascal and Midnight. I went down there to see his dogs, he had about twenty to thirty puppies in his backyard. And Homer was one of them, the other pup was Festus, the other was Snooty, and the other was Monroe. I bought some puppies and after a while, I came back to buy Festus. I traded Festus for Snooty. They grew up. I was trying to book a fight with Snooty. There was a guy bragging about a dog from the Zebo line. I was agreeing with 20 kilos for the fight, but they wanted me with 19 kilos. So I traded Homer for Wayne Honeycutt, then I traded Snooty for Homer. The opponent wanted to change the weight again, so I never scored anything with them again. I stayed with Homer, put him in a test against a Zebo dog. He ruined the dog's jaw in five minutes, I had to take him out. I let Wayne take him to cross. Then I put Homer to fight. Against a dog, the son of the dog Gator, with a daughter of the grand champion Art. He was the best dog I saw fight Homer, but he also lost his teeth. Both dogs was a fighting style, who liked to bite the opponent's mouth. But it was a mistake for him to go mouth to mouth with Homer. His jaw and teeth were so strong, he could knock another dog's teeth out. That's the advantage of a dog with a good, strong mouth. They can ruin another dog's mouth without damaging their teeth. I kept bits of bones and teeth that Zebo and Homer tore from their opponents. I gave the pieces to a guy who wanted to make a necklace out of them. Homer has fought seven times, and four times with me. The first one wasn't difficult. A kid in South Carolina had a dog he had trained for a fight with D. Holcomb and I stopped him at 40 pounds. He was a dog of the Yellow John lineage. A week before the fight, the guy who was conditioning Homer called me. He told me that Homer was sick and that I'd better pay the fine. I paid the fine for not being able to fight, and I brought Homer to my house. When I was walking with him to put him on the chain. He bit some leaves that were on the bank of the river, and his fur was shining. I noticed that he would recover quickly if he was sick. I remembered the boy from South Carolina and scheduled a fight with him. His next fight was against Johnny Johnson, he said he had a dog, that he would finish Homer. It was a cross between Zebo and Red Boy. Boy, was he a very smart dog, and he had me worried for the first twenty minutes. He had Homer by the ear, and he was backing up fast, it didn't look like Homer could catch him. Homer was pushing him, and his opponent was holding. When the opponent touched the side of the ring with his tail, he would do a maneuver and reverse back in another direction. After twenty minutes, Homer managed to catch him, and more and more and hit the dog's chest. You could see the dog's eyes dilate every time Homer cornered him and pushed him. One of the Indians owned the dog, and the dog was his family pet. I told him, he's killing your dog. Johnny laughed and told him. He is trying to scare you because he is afraid of losing the battle. So I said. It's his choice. My boy, let him continue. Fifty-eight minutes passed, their dog fell and could not fight anymore. After a short time the dog died. He won that fight, and another fight that followed, and he never got credit for them. I let Ken Murray prepare Homer to fight a dog that had beaten his brother. Ken called me weeks later and said, L. 
We will have to pay the fine. Homer went through a plate glass window after a chicken and cut off the whole head. I was a bit suspicious, especially when he offered to pay the fine for me. About a year later, one of his friends got into a fight with him and called me. He told me that one of Ken's friends had a dog, and they were getting ready for a fight. They thought their dog could kill Zebo. So Ken pitted him against this dog for $800, and Homer won the fight in 18 to 20 minutes. In his next fight, the guy who made the fight was Hensley, but the dog was Larry Jarrett and Irish Jerry named Bar Room. He was a good dog, he was the whole fight after Homer, but he fought for over an hour. I said if you take the dog, I'll take mine too. And they said they would pick it up, to wait just another five minutes. They waited too long, the dog tried to fight back and fell. I got the bar room myself, tried to see if he could scratch the courtesy. He tried harder to fall first. I tried to save the dog, but he died anyway. Then I booked a fight, with Eddie Frederick. He had a dog named Poison who had won a fight. He called me and said. I think I have a dog that can defeat Homer. I told him. That there was only one way to find out. So we agreed on a date. About two weeks later he called me and said. That everyone was saying that Homer would kill his dog quickly. He said there were some boys up north who had two dogs and wanted to bet on them. And that I could compete with Homer, and he would compete with Poison on the other dog. If that was okay with me. I said it didn't matter to me, a dog is a dog. It was the Wreckers, and they showed up with a snooty woods dog, and a bully son bitch. Man, he was an excellent biter. He was biting very hard, but with less than ten minutes, I already noticed that Homer was hurting that dog a lot. He was biting his paws, chest and was leading the fight. The other dog started to cry, but he was still struggling. The odds on that fight were 500 to 200, and we didn't get any bets. Eddie Pickard was standing next to me and he said. Boy, looks like that dog is biting hard. I answered. I can see he's biting. He was the dog that ruined Homer's face. Homer even bends his back when he was biting his face. Homer showed no weakness, so Homer put him down. The dog gave up in 28 minutes. He was weighing three pounds more than Homer. I just didn't accept the fine, because they said that if I paid the fine, they wouldn't put the dog. Then Mrs. Hughes said. One of Homer's struggles was just before Cole was born. All the smoke in the ring was making me sick, so I couldn't stay there. Homer was so deep in the dog's chest, you couldn't see his face. He would pick the dog up in the corner and keep digging deeper into the chest until you couldn't see much of his head but his ears. I don't know how he could breathe. His face had just healed from the fight with the wrecker's dog. And that day, he had half his nose ripped off again. Then Mr. Hughes continued. I've never seen Homer bite anything but the shoulders. He had a big scar on one of his shoulders. I believe that it was the bar room that did it. I sold Homer to Ricky Jones for an insane amount. He tagged him in a fight against a 50-pound dog. If I'd known, he would score a fight with a much bigger dog. I would never have sold Homer to him. It took two hours and two minutes to kill that one. There has always been a rumor that Homer was a stray who would give up if he got into trouble, and in that last game he proved his gameness. Since he was fighting for more than an hour. It would be difficult to say which was the best dog he produced, 
there were many good dogs. I would have to say Spooky Grand Champion. Spooky is from Champion Homer's first cross to Susie. Champion Lil Bill and Spider Bitem were the result of the second crossing. It was repeated a third time, but it had no offspring. I do not promote, support or condone any violations of the Animal Welfare Act 1976. Or any other local, state and federal law. I am not affiliated with dogfighting in any way, or in any way. I am simply a pet owner and enthusiast of the American Pit Bull Terrier, and the great history and legacy passed down through the generations. I believe it is important to know where we came from to know where we are going. Articles posted are strictly for historical and educational purposes. I do not necessarily represent the views expressed in these articles.